What's up guys, Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's Sanderson Farms Championship Top 3 Trophy on the PGA Tour at this event. The salaries came out super late on this Monday. I don't want to waste any more time. Let's jump right into the preview and also know that everything you see comes from rickrungood.com. It's my website. Sign up. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's go. Country Club of Jackson. That's right. We've played here every year since uh, 2015. And what you're seeing right now in the course key stats model is a course where driving accuracy uh, does not necessarily matter quite as much. And uh, distance is certainly more important. And then guys who generally putt well have found success here. So if you're new, if you're just coming in new season, amped up from the Ryder Cup, welcome. This is one of my favorite tools. This is a regression model that I have run for the last couple of years. It seems to get better and better every single year where it is more predictive instead of reactive. And it tells us what what types of players are having success at every single course on the PGA Tour. So driving accuracy, when you see it rank 46th, that means that out of 70 courses, there are 45 where driving accuracy is more important. If you see driving distance ranked 23rd, you that means that only 22 courses is driving distance more important. So it's basically in the top third. So what you're generally seeing is a strokes gained approach top third stat, driving distance top third stat, and then the maybe most important stat is strokes gained putting. And what does that really mean? mean obviously Sergio Garcia won this event last year well I don't look at just winners I look at every single player in the field and players for that season who rank well in strokes gained putting are going have found more success at this event um, b by far basically than any other stat there are only four other courses on tour where strokes gained putting uh, had a stronger correlation to success over the years so we'll look at who fits this uh, type of model, but before we do, we're back on Bermuda. It is a fairly long par 72. The par fives, you can kind of, uh, you know, a couple of them are, are a little bit longer, but generally larger than average green, 6,200 yards. Uh, excuse, <laughs> that would be quite sizable, 6,200 square feet on average. Now, so if we take the results of our correlation here at the top and we apply that to the actual players and skill sets in the field, what type or not what type of player, which players should be a good fit for the country club of Jackson and number one is Mito Pereira. That's right, baby. Let's go. Now you'll know I have this, I have this filter to the last 50 rounds. Mito doesn't have 50 measured rounds. He only has 26 measured rounds. So keep that in mind. But because of the strengths that Mito has both in distance and ball striking, and he's putted well enough uh, on his, you know, his 26 measured rounds, uh, he is getting uh, essentially the best grade for course fit right behind Taylor Pendrith. Another guy who does not have a lot of rounds, very interested to see uh, kind of where he's headed this week. And then the man, the myth, the legend, Sam Burns, uh, who we are going to talk a lot about Sam Burns in just one second. Let me round out the top five here with Charlie Hoffman. Corey Connors. That is the top five in terms of course fit. Of course, that's over the last 50 rounds. You can start adjusting the time frames on this and see how it changes the numbers. But I'm, I'm already very, very stoked that those are the types of golfers or those are the golfers that have uh, shown up here on course fit because we are going to use that information. We're going to use that knowledge. We're going to build a custom model at the end. And then we are going to see who might be some really, really good plays for our team. Now, I will let you know, if you want to win a subscription to rickrungood.com, there are two ways to do so. If you're here on YouTube, make sure that you've liked the video, make sure you are subscribed, and comment below with who you think is going to win the Sanderson Farms Championship. Who's going to hoist that rooster trophy? I think it's a rooster. It's not a chicken. A rooster trophy on Sunday evening. The second way would be to go to the iTunes version of this show. It's called 300 Yards to Unknown. Leave a five-star rating and review. Say something nice about the show. Leave me your Twitter handle. That gets you into a draw to win a subscription to rickrungood.com, and you can win like Michael Steliotis? Steliotis? Apologies on that pronunciation. And Sam Diego did. I've already reached out to both of you uh, to get you set up with your subscription to rickrungood.com. The cheat sheet. Let's go. Oh my gosh. I, 
it took so long for this to come out. I, I'm just so excited to see it. Five golfers over $10,000 on DraftKings. $11,000 flat for Sam Burns. Will Zalatoris is 10-8. Sergio Garcia is 10-5. Sung JM is 10-3. And Corey Connors is 10-1. All of these guys, viable, viable plays. Let's talk about a couple of them more in depth. Sam Burns at 11000 I am a Sam Burns truther. Okay, let's just let's just put that out there. I love Sam Burns. I am actually on record in a Golf Digest article that I wrote, which you can go read right now, called 10, I think it's called 10 Golfers That Will Win You Money This Season, something like that. I think Sam Burns is the perfect kind of breakout star candidate. And what I mean from that is maybe it's multiple wins this year. Uh, he is the epitome of the modern player where he hits it long. He's a great ball striker. He actually putts better than most people want to give him credit for. And he is an absolute high ceiling golfer. What do I mean by high ceiling golfer? So you're not going to see that uh, necessarily here on his golfer profile page, but what you'll note is that in 12% of rounds last season for Sam Burns, of rounds, he gained at least five strokes on the field. Five strokes in a single round. In 12% of his rounds, it was the highest rate on the PGA Tour. When you start going down a little bit further, you know, gaining three, gaining four uh, strokes per round, he is amongst his peers of Bryson DeChambeau, Justin Thomas. I mean, just, just the top players in the world. That is the company that he is sharing. And he really, quote, only had one win to show for it last year, right? Uh, but a few other really close opportunities. If he just cleans up what we're seeing to be like one bear round a week, uh, Sam Burns is going to contend and he is going to win a lot. He is already, as we know, a great fit for the country club of Jackson because he hits it far. He's great on approach. He putts really well. I mean, this is just an absolute go spot. He, it, Bermuda's his best surface. I mean, this is just, um, to me, like uh, the field composition, everything else you know, he's probably going to miss the cut because this is his first event of the season, all that stuff. But like, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited to get access to Sam Burns this year. And I think it starts right now. There will be some level of temptation to go back to Sergio Garcia, who won this event last year, who played well down the stretch, who was awesome at the Ryder Cup. It's always tough to kind of say how much is that uh, week in, at Whistling Straits going to impact Sergio, whether it's emotionally, physically, played a lot of golf over the past couple of days. Who, who knows? Uh, I just think there are just kind of more interesting options, especially as we start to see the uh, the ownership shakeout. I love Will Zalatoris. He's going to be great. We're going to play him a lot, but I do want to point out Sung J.M. Sung J.M. is is low-key kind of turning back into, into himself again, which is a, a really good ball-striking version of himself, right? So coming down the stretch at the end of last season, he gained strokes off the tee in six consecutive events. He gained strokes on approach in four of his last five. Bermuda is his best putting surface. That stretch of golf was highlighted by a third place finish at the BMW Championship, and this is just a much weaker field than anything he has played in as of late. Sung J M, someone at the top that is certainly worth investing on. The other interesting player is Corey Connors, and I, I have to admit, uh, you know, I do not play a lot of cash games. I'm generally not looking for safe-ish players, but if you are looking for kind of safety, one would think Corey Connors fits the mold for that. He has gained strokes off the tee every single event since the Genesis Invitational. Yeah, think, think about that. During that same stretch, he's only lost strokes on approach in three events. That's like six months of, of starts. Now he is not a very good short game player. He's a pretty sour putter, but his best surface. And I put that into air quotes. If you're not watching me on YouTube is Bermuda. He still loses a quarter of a stroke putting per round on Bermuda, but that is significantly better than the other surfaces that he puts on. Cause he's so bad at it. So, um, we have seen him just pile up these top 20 finishes. You wonder what his upside might actually be. Can he win? Can he finish second? Can he finish in the top five? I don't know, but I just generally think, hey, he's trending towards a lot of top 25 finishes. This is a really good setup for him. It is a, a, a very soft field. If I was looking for a little bit more safety, Corey Connors would probably be that guy. 
Before we hop on down to that $9,000 range, I must tell you that there are not one, not two, but three different live chats this week. That's right. There is your standard Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time live chat, all things Sanderson Farms, whatever you want to talk about from ownership and tea time draw and stat, like whatever you want to talk about, let's go and do it. Uh, same night, Wednesday night, 8.15 p.m. Eastern time. That's the Jock Market Power Hour. If you're not playing on Jock Market, it's Stock Market DFS. It's a fascinatingly fun time. Um, you can now short golfers. You can buy and sell shares of golfers during the event. You can bid on them on Wednesday night. That's what we're going to do. If you use the code Rick, you get the best deposit bonus available. It's up to $50. And then the Cut Sweat Show is back because we've got a cut this week. That is going to be tentatively Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern. That might change a little bit uh, just because we'll see how the cut is going. We'll see how sweaty it is. I'll try to jump on at some of the most... Uh, uh, crucial times. It's a data-driven cut sweat show. It's always a lot of fun. That will be along with the other two chats all on Rick Run Good YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Rick Run Good. Back to the cheat sheet. We'll jump down on to that $9,000 range and we're led off by Mito Pereira. Uh, it's kind of a short range, right? Only seven or eight golfers here. A couple of intriguing options. We'll talk about Mito, considering he, uh, and I talk about him every single week, so if you've been following along, there's probably no reason uh, for me to go through this entire spiel, but since he came up on July 4th last year, he's been awesome, and he's doing it in a way that is really, really sustainable. He was third in strokes gained approach at the Fortinet Championship. Uh, that was uh, two weeks ago. He finished third there. He has now gained strokes on approach in one, two, three, four, five of his last six measured events, and basically every event uh, since coming up at the Rocket Mortgage last year. When you start seeing this, a golfer who finishes third at the Fortinet, fourth at the Olympics, sixth at the 3M Open, fifth at the Barbasol. He won three times on the Corn Ferry Tour last year. What does that tell you? It tells you he's a magnet to the top of the leaderboard. So, this is a skill, guys. There is a skill to winning, and there is a skill to being around the lead. And, and we are starting to see Mito, essentially at every level of golf that he's playing, gravitate towards the lead. It's a really, really good sign because it is a skill just as much as all the other stuff is. So no surprise to see Mito on my short list. A couple of concerns here, maybe just one concern. I don't know what to do with Cameron Tringale here. He's $9,400. He is, um, you know, he had a decent year last year, but his his one really big improvement, the driver, it fell off a cliff. And you can kind of see this is his career, career trajectory on uh, strokes gained off the tee. So you can see even going back to what, 2011, 2010, when we start getting strokes gained on Cameron Tringale, he is a small positive driver of the golf ball. And then in more recent years, he added distance to that game. And then what we started to see, especially towards the end of uh, last season, is he just kind of loses the ability to drive the ball. You know, his last one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine. Nine of his last 10 measured events, he lost strokes off the tee. When you compare that to the 10 before that, he lost strokes off the tee once, it appears. Quick math. I was kind of hoping that the time off between the BMW Championship and the Fortinet would have been an opportunity for him to kind of get that fixed. Didn't necessarily see that uh, in Napa, which leaves me just genuinely concerned, and I don't know what to do. Uh, his odds are very short. His his uh, price tag is very high. I think I will just opt to go with some other guys in this range here. One thing I do want to do is I want to go to uh, the Holy Grail. I want to go to the stats tab. I don't often show this a lot. There's just so many different tools on the website. I don't, I kind of get into a groove on these videos and I don't always show some of my favorite ones, believe it or not. But if you scroll down, so this is a tool that you can see um, every single PGA Tour stat and then you can come down and you can see kind of like last whatever number of rounds that you want. So let's just do last 24 rounds. And when we're talking about um, the things that are going to go well at Country Club, of, Country Club of Jackson, we know that approach is, is important, right? Last 24 rounds, you're seeing uh, Keegan Bradley, who is in the $9,700 range. He's first in this field. Uh, Harold Varner III, who is uh, fourth in this field. He's in the $9,000 range. I'm just picking out the $9,000 guys for now. The rest of this, the rest of those top five are, are, are Bromlett, Burgoon, and Carlos Ortiz. More on those guys a little bit later. Then let's look at uh, kind of putting. Well, uh, I don't have to go far. I can actually, I don't even have to sort this because I can see it on the format.
formatting here. Of those five guys that I named, Harold Varner III is the only guy who, one, is checking off the approach bucket, and two, trekking, checking off the putting bucket, which is him gaining uh, half a stroke per round on the putting surface. In fact, all the other top five guys are losing at least six tenths of a stroke per round with the putter. So that is a huge difference there. So here we have a $9,200 uh, Harold Varner III that is starting to uh, show the signs of someone who should find success at the Country Club of Jackson. He had a top 20 at Safeway. He had a top tw uh, 15 at both the BMW and the Northern Trust. Another top 15 back at the, uh, I always confuse that. Would that be Barracuda or Barbasol? Whatever was right after the Olympics or same week as the Olympics, excuse me. So uh, this is a really interesting spot to deploy Howard Varner III, and I got And you guys know this. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of him all the time, but this is starting to shape itself up. And if all of that, all of that, did not entice you, um, you know, you can look at. Uh, oh, sorry, I was looking at a different set of results. Dude, just forget that entire thought there. Uh, he has missed the cut once. <laughs> he missed it in 2019. Uh, he has he did not play the last two years, but this in theory should be a good course fit for him based on what he is doing right there. My whole grand finale at the end of the at the end of the spiel on uh, on on Harold Martin the third kind of went sideways, but you get the point. The final guy that I'll make note of here is uh, Cam Davis, who's $9,100. And any time, let's just go back to the course key stats here. Any time that a, a radar chart or the model looks like this, where accuracy is not that important and driving distance is more important and we can lean on kind of ball striking and maybe he can get hot with the putter, uh, that is generally a better setup for Cam Davis. Um, let me show you his profile here. He's been much more volatile recently um, with both the ball striking, but also with the putter. He's starting to putt a lot better, uh, which is exciting. He's just kind of has to kind of marry the longer term ball striking with the shorter term short game stuff. If he does that, he's going to be unbeatable. We saw him uh, generally uh, marry those together at the Rocket Mortgage. That's an event that he won just two and a half months ago. So we'll see what the evolution of Cam Davis is, but with a little bit of time off, uh, raw talent and a course that should be better than average for him. Uh, it certainly, it certainly excites me. You know, the AK range is actually kind of exciting here. I was pretty down on this field, uh, but when I went through the 9K and found a couple of guys I really liked, and I'm going through the 8K range and I see some guys that I actually really like. Um, yeah, I think, I think I can do this. So, so uh, $8,900 Kevin Streelman, that's probably going to be pretty chalky. Finished seventh at the Wyndham Championship, 19th at the Open Championship, uh, finished fourth here two years ago, has three top 20 finishes in his last four starts. I kind of understand that. I might pivot down to Seamus Power, 8,800. Again, if you've been following this channel for more than like two weeks, uh, you, you know I'm going to talk about Seamus Power here. We're going to talk about how great of a ball striker he's been. I'm going to note that he has finished inside the top 20 and six of his last uh, eight starts on tour, which includes his win at the Barbasol. Now get with that, that full tour status, right? Starting his, for the first time, his new season with full tour status. You know, this is a guy that might really thrive. I don't want to say he's going to be a breakout star, but he certainly owns these skill sets that you want to see out of out of your golfers, especially kind of in this range. And he's already shown us the upside with a victory in an opposite field event. So I certainly don't mind that. Carlos Ortiz is interesting because he popped up earlier, right? When we went and did, what did we do? We went to the Holy Grail. We went to the stats. We went to the last 24 rounds. I sorted it by strokes gained approach. And Carlos Ortiz was fifth. That's noteworthy for a couple reasons. One, anytime a guy's ball striking it well, uh, it's exciting. End of story. He has not putted well at all. In fact, he's been one of the worst putters in, the, in this field over the last 24 rounds. But maybe it's a friendly return to the country club of Jackson for him because if of all the golfers um, in this field with at least 10 rounds played at the country club of Jackson... Carlos Ortiz has the best uh, strokes gained per round number. It's over two. He missed the cut last year, but he had a fourth place finish in 20 and a third place finish in 19. So I'm wondering if a couple weeks off, we didn't see him play in Napa, uh, maybe an opportunity to get a little bit right, go back to a place that's been a good spot for him over the years. It's a little bit exciting. Not as exciting, Matthew Wolf. And I have not done this rant about Matthew Wolf in a while, so I'll just make it quick. 
I'm hoping that with uh, what five weeks off now, he has he has found a way to fix the driver. Uh, I also was hoping that from the time that he took off from the Zurich Classic to the U.S. Open uh, for one week, he was great driving the golf ball at Torrey Pines. We haven't really seen that come back outside of one good week at the Wyndham Championship. Um, but he loses five strokes at the Northern Trust. He loses four and a half at the 3M Open. Other weeks, he's just a zero. Matthew Wolf cannot be a zero with the driver. He can't be. He has to gain two, three, four strokes over the course of four days for him to really contend. So I don't know what version of Matthew Wolf we are going to get uh, this week and or moving forward, but I'm taking a very cautious wait and see approach. Two other golfers down here at the bottom of this range. Eh, let's call it two. Aaron Wise and Patton Kazire. Um, again, that article that I referenced uh, that I wrote for Golf Digest, uh, you can go find it. I also wrote up both of these guys. They are kind of high ceiling value-ish type players. Patton Kazire was one of the most valuable fantasy players on, on tour last season. That's when you take how many fantasy points per $1,000 of salary was he. Patton Kazire was very much near the top of that list. We saw him fly off the leaderboard on some Sunday days. We saw him with a lot of kind of top 25 finishes, very, very boom or bust. And then Aaron Wise, you know, at his peak has a lot of raw talent. And we saw him make the cut to the Wyndham Championship. He finished top 25 at both the Northern Trust and the BMW Championship before his season uh, was ended, right? He did not advance into the playoffs, but Finished 17th here last year, has made the cut in three uh, consecutive trips, that's over four years, to the Country Club of Jackson. I would not mind kind of buying into some of the raw talent, more established PGA Tour players instead of necessarily maybe the shiny new objects that are coming up from the Corn Ferry or something like that. We got to get a good we got to get a good mix this week. We got to give guys credit uh, for getting back to their baseline and, and not just jumping to conclusions that they're that they're kind of washed a little bit. The $7,000 range. And to me, this is where the field kind of falls off a little bit. You know, Taylor Pendrith, who, again, I do not have a lot of measured rounds on him in the database, uh, did make the cut at the Fortinet Championship in Napa two weeks ago. I think there is a consensus that he's going to be a really impressive player as he continues to grow 13th uh, or two top 15 finishes at both the Barracuda and the Barbasol this year, $7,800. Additionally, um, we have Joseph Bramlett here in this range, who's 7,900. He won, I believe, oh, I should look this up, but he won one of those Corn Ferry playoff events. It might have been the Corn Ferry finals. He he actually won it. And if we go to this, this trends tool, so again, something I don't show as much as I should, if you scroll down on the trends tool, it shows you these kind of breakout candidates, which the idea of this is to find golfers who are hitting it really, really well from tee to green, but putting below their baseline with the, with the, um, theory that they're going to start putting just back to normal. Whether it's good or bad, they're going to putt to normal. And Joseph Bramlett, you can see, is in the uh, the best quadrant. He is in the upper left. That is guys who are getting unlucky putting, meaning they're not putting as well as they normally do, and then also hitting it uh, well from tee to green. So that's kind of an interesting little dynamic for Bramlett. And I believe he also did didn't he also show up when we did? Yes. Uh, last 24 round strokes gained approach. He's number two in this field. So there are certainly a lot of things pointing in his direction. He also hits it very, very far. He makes a lot of birdies. I think I'm talking myself into uh, Joseph Bramlett here at $7,900. The rest of this 7K range, uh, woof, I, I'm not super, uh, super excited about. I think that there's uh, a little bit of interest for me on... Luke List, who we know hits it far, we know um, can be a little bit of a good ball striker, not very good with the putter, uh, which is a little bit concerning, but he is a popper, right? He's got a uh, super high upside. He finished runner up here in 2017. He's missed the cut in his last two trips. Maybe I could go in that route. I do continue to like David Lipsky. What did we see from him at the Fortinet? Uh, we saw him finish uh, with the round of the day on Friday. It was a 64, flies up the leaderboard, ends up finishing 22nd. He is now... 20 events or so deep into his PGA Tour career. This now for the first time with full status. You imagine he is priming and gearing up for um, a, a good season. What I also think is, and we saw this from Mito, we see this from a lot of guys, The what happens on the PGA Tour... Um, you got to learn the routine. You got to know where the locker rooms are, where the food is. There's just so much going on that Lipsky having 20 events under his belt 
I feel like the the learning curve for him, or at least the comfort curve, is going to be so much shorter. He's kind of used to this. Then you get a bunch of guys who are making some their first, their second, their third PGA Tour start, and it, it's just a little bit different. So I I kind of like. The next three to five weeks for David Lipsky, not only is he a great player and I think he's going to be good, I think he's going to have a little bit of a comfort edge on some of these other guys who are coming up. And I think that's, I do think that's important. Um, Let's see who else we have here in the 7K range, at the bottom of the 7K range. Chad Ramey is here uh, at $7,000. He missed the cut at the Fortinet Championship. He is, uh, he's a Mississippi kid, right? Mississippi State, I believe he went to. So it might be a little bit more comfortable uh, in Jackson at the Country Club of Jackson uh, this week. So I'll be interested to keep an eye out on him. He's a flat $7,000. Then you get into this 6 k range, and boy, if it was ugly before, um, it's even uglier now. You know, we've seen uh, Sam Ryder kind of be interesting. Uh, because he's, again, a popper, hits the ball well, has not had much uh, success at the Country Club of Jackson. John Augenstein is interesting. Let me pull up John Augenstein for you. Augenstein goes uh, T6 at the Fortinet. Now, he's played PGA Tour events uh, in the past. He's played others this year to not much success at all, but his last three on the PGA Tour, he has made the cut uh, in all three of them. So T20 at the Charles Schwab, which was back in May, T37 at the Wyndham, that was in August, and then uh, just two weeks ago, the T6 at the Fortinet Championship. And what I what I note out of that is it's now five consecutive events he's gained strokes on approach. The Fortinet was unbelievable. I think he was second or third in strokes gained approach that week. And his last three, he's putted much better. That was really a big bugaboo, and even around the green as well. As this kid from Vanderbilt continues to grow into a professional player, we're going to learn a lot about him, and we're going to see what that learning curve is. This might be a roll a roll it back out spot. Like, let's try John Augustine one more time. He's sub 7000 He's $6,700. let us do it. While we're here... Um, you know, this 6K range is incredibly difficult. So what I'm actually going to do on the Holy Grail here is I'm going to do a couple of things. I want to see if we can just find a couple of, of kind of flyers here. I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with Bermuda grass greens and I'm going to sort by strokes gain putting. And I'm going to look for guys in the 6K range. No surprise to see Denny McCarthy here. He's great on all surfaces. Peter Malnati's here and he had a great run trying to steal this away from, uh, Sergio Garcia last year, but unfortunately he has just missed a ton of cuts recently. I'm not sure I would be all that excited to go back to him. What's Cody Gribble been up to? Not much. Lots of missed cuts. Okay. I'm trying to find six K guys here. JT Poston. Well, T 26 at the Wells Fargo championship played well here last year, finished third. Had a top. Where do you have that close call at? Uh, oh, it's not a measured event. So he had, he finished, uh, he probably should have won. Again, I confuse these all the time. Either Barbasol or Barracuda. I cannot remember which one it was, but he was in the driver's seat there. That's not an event that's measured. So it's actually, his results are probably a little bit better. Okay, I don't mind that. I don't mind posting at 6,600. I'm not super excited to run it back out there. What's Michael Thompson been up to? Three consecutive cuts in a row. Oh, this is on Bermuda. Apologies. Three consecutive cuts in a row on Bermuda. Okay. I don't, I don't necessarily mind that. Let's do one other thing real quick. Let's just get rid of Bermuda and let's just do strokes gain T to green since, um, let's go like since July 1st, just kind of a shorter term little run here. Strokes gain T to green. Look for golfers with a good sample size who are also in the 6k range. Roy Sabatini is number one. Uh, he only played four times. One was the Olympics finished runner up. The other was the Wyndham championship. Ryan Moore, 12 rounds in that time frame, missed the cut three, four times, but had a T2 at John Deere. Probably not excited about that. Yeah, it's ugly. It's really ugly. The 6K range is incredibly ugly. Maybe, I obviously haven't started building lineups yet, and I would love to get Sam Burns or some of the guys up at the top, but it might be a situation in which we just have to go more balanced. I mean, I'm just really not sure where to find uh, the value in the 6K range. I'm working. I don't know. I'm working really hard. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm finding it. Michael Thompson, 6,400 might be the lowest I'd be willing to go. Wyndham Clark is also at the same price tag. I would love it if doc could get it going. He's missed, uh, unfortunately five of his last six, however, and maybe JT Poston, maybe we ride with a little bit of course history, a little bit of, uh, Bermuda success, 
Maybe we roll with that. That's probably the lowest I'm comfortable going. Let's run a model. So this is the custom model on rickrungood.com. You can put in any number of rounds, any date range, any weights, however you want it. So what do we know about this course? Um, a couple of things. Well, let's do last 24. Well, should I do longer? Because some guys have had like three, four, five weeks off. All right. I'm going to skew a little bit further. I would have liked to have done 16 or 24. I'm going to do like 34. Skew just a little bit wider to say, you know, the guys who haven't played since last season have had five weeks off. Uh, maybe everybody kind of gets back to their baseline. Let's just say 34. And I know that um, distance is important, but accuracy is not all that important. So let's go 20. Uh, let's go 20 on driving distance. I know strokes gained is important. Let's do 20 on uh, strokes gained approach. Excuse me. I know that's important. Let's go 20 on strokes gained approach. And let's go 20 on putting. That's something I don't normally do ever, but that is, remember, if we go back to the course key stats, that's what this says. It says uh, putting is important. Strokes gain approach is important. Uh, distance is more important than accuracy by a somewhat wide margin. So let's let's continue to roll with that. Then also that leaves us with uh, 60 weights. Should I just do 20 on birdie or better knowing that this is a 19 under par average winning score? Maybe I go 19 under. And then that leaves us with 20. What can I do with 20? Well, I could do um, 10. So here's what I'll do. This is kind of freaky. Uh, yeah, let's do it. 10 on par five scoring. There's uh, It's par 72. So 10 on par five scoring. And then let's do 10 on three putt avoidance, which I know is really ramping up the putting stuff. But these, these surfaces are a little bit larger than average, 6,200, I believe is what I said, square feet on average. And usually the, the, the larger you get, uh, the more three putts you get. So let's run this and see what happens. And my number one golfer is, oh boy. Oh boy. It is Sam Burns by a mile. Wow. Wow. Maybe skipping Sam Burns wasn't going to happen. So his value, uh, which is the stat that this is calculated off of, it's the stat that you can simulate off of, is 91. Charlie Hoffman is number two, and he's 76, so that is a 15-point gap. That The gap between then Charlie Hoffman and the if you use that same gap, it would go down to, what, 61, which would be the golfer in about 26th. That's how big the gap is on Sam Burns for the model that I just ran. So my top 10 is as follows. Uh, Burns, Hoffman, Woodland, Kevin Tway. That's terrifying. HV3, no problem with that. Adam Shank at 6,700. Seamus Power at 88. Patrick Rogers at 76. Cameron Tringali at 94. And Patton Kazire at 8,200. Wow. Interesting. So I've got to figure out how much money I plan on losing on Sam Burns. I've got to figure out uh, what the deal is with Kevin Tway. Going to have to do some research there. Ooh, man. I do love that HV3 is in there. I'm cool with that. I'm um, cool with Hoffman, although I probably can't get all these guys in the same lineup. Shank would be a little bit of salary cap relief. So this is very interesting. So, okay. That's, um, that's my homework. Uh, your homework is a couple of things. Join me for the three other live chats that we have going on this week on Rick Rungood YouTube channel. Might as well just sign up for rickrungood.com while you're there. You can run your own model. You can tweak as many times as you want. You can generate lineups. You can send them uh, and then and then input them into uh, DraftKings. You can look at all the tools that I showed you until your heart's content and uh, you can win all the money, which is something I encourage you to do. Let me know what you think. Tweet me at Rick Rungood or leave a comment below. Best of luck and I'll talk to you guys soon.